Hello. Back in the 1970s, when I was a Jehovah's Witness in downtown Toronto, I was already aware of this fellow, Northrop Fry. He was at that time living in Toronto, downtown Toronto. So that gave me something in common with him. But I was aware already, even as a Jehovah's Witness in my prime, that he was the most famous literary critic, not only in North America, but probably in the world too. And then in 1981, 82, around the time I was marrying Vivian, he came out with this book. He was already close to 70 years old. The Great Code came out. And in this book, as you can see, subtitled The Bible and Literature, Fry put forth his thesis that despite the wide unbelief, certainly in scholarly and academic circles, that Fry himself would have found in the University of Toronto and all his, his, his other intellectual and physical travels. The wide unbelief of our culture, the, the moving away from Christianity, he thought was uh, a mistake because not only was it a rejection of our, our historical religion, but it was also a, re a rejection of Western literature as well. So he sought in this book, The Great Code, to show the ways that scripture and Western literature cannot be disentangled. I'd just like to read you a couple of excerpts from The Great Code, which illustrate the, what Fry, for instance, thought was the reason that Christianity overthrew not just the Roman Empire, but ancient paganism. Page 91 of the book, uh, Fry takes on what amounts to one of the great misconceptions of the last 15, 20 years, is that somehow it's, 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 it's penetrated the average non-sophisticated Western mind that Christianity owes its origins to pagan mythology. Well, Fry takes that theory on in the 1980s, just as C.S. Lewis had taken it on in the 1920s. Here's what he says. For well over a century, the Bible has been seen to have many traces of pre-biblical thought and ritual. And it is clear that cults older than the Bible are involved, or were originally involved, in such episodes as Jephthah's sacrifice of his daughter, or Jacob's setting up of a sacred stone at Bethel. Accompanying archaeology was a vast expansion of comparative data from religions, folk tales, customs, and rituals from every part of human time and space, all suggesting affinities to something biblical. So Fry is alluding to the great growth in archaeology and comparative religion studies back in the late Victorian era. Hence, there was a growth of comparative studies that tended to look at the Bible centrifugally, collecting analogues from it, of its themes on the assumption that there is nothing in the Bible that cannot be found in some parallel form outside it. Such an approach in Fraser, that's James Fraser and others, introduces the student to the whole panorama of imagery and narrative the human mythology has produced and thereby implies that we may finally come to some understanding of a universal language of symbolism. The only trouble with this is that while the parallels are suggestive and even tantalizing, an endless diffusion of analogies does not seem to be getting anywhere, much less nearer an understanding of universal symbolism. To adapt a phrase of the famous poet Wallace Stevens, there is a continuous dazzle that never yields to clarity. We might get more sense of direction if we looked at the situation from something closer to the Bible's own point of view. From its own point of view, surely the Bible is providing the antitypes of which Canaanite and other pre-biblical cults are types. Antitypes therefore has the idea built into it of shadows. That is that the types of the Canaanite and other pagan religions were shadows of what the, has come to fruition or reality in Christianity or the Bible. The Bible claims by implication to indicate what the symbolism of such cults really means by relating them to the worship of the true God. If we accept such a claim as a heuristic principle that the critical axiom above goes into reverse, if there is so little in the Bible for which some analogy cannot be found somewhere else, there is correspondingly little to be found anywhere else 
that cannot be found in some form in the Bible. If we take the Bible as a key to mythology, instead of taking mythology in general as a key to the Bible, we should at least have a definite starting point wherever we end. Let me read the last sentence again. This is his reversal of the usual approach, both in his day and in our day. If we take the Bible as a key to mythology, instead of taking mythology in general as a key to the Bible, we should at least have a definite starting point wherever we end. Another reason that Fry says that Christianity overthrew not only paganism but the Roman Empire is page 95 in his book. He says there have been many explanations for Christianity's triumph over all other religions of its time, but the most visible explanation was the brilliance of its revolutionary tactics. It set up a counterpart of imperial authority in the church, which could go underground in times of persecution until the time it came up for it to emerge and take over, or at least merge with temporal power. Marcus Aurelius, that's the greatest emperor of the later Roman Empire, Empire. Marcus Aurelius spoke of the parataxis, the military discipline of the Christians as their strongest asset. So just as Christianity, whether viewed literally or symbolically, subsumed and essentially absorbed the best of paganism, Fry is saying similarly in the area of Roman order, Christianity was quite able to even overthrow Rome in terms of military tactics. Of course, he's speaking metaphorically there too. The things that Marcus Aurelius could say to admire, although he persecuted Christianity, he almost saw prophetically what was inevitable, namely that Christianity had a strength that even the empire at its best did not match. Back to the point of the religious superiority of Christianity to what came before, Fry says this, coming of Jesus into the world then seems to have taken place historically at one of those dialectical confrontations in which history suddenly expands to myth and indicates a dimension beyond the historical. So when we use the word myth, we are always using it in a negative sense, but of course Fry doesn't believe that. History, he says, becomes or expands to myth. The poet W. H. Auden has attempted in his For the Time Being and elsewhere to show how the completeness of the pagan achievement, along with its obvious limitations, formed an appropriate background for the incarnation. So that's Northrop Fry's take on why Christianity overthrew paganism and even the Roman Empire. Northrop Fry, The Great Code. <laughs>